the area here. In the book of John, you find that John begins a series of discouragements to his disciples. And, you know, that's, that's kind of heartbreaking. This world, so many times, we look at it and things aren't fair. I mean, bad things happen. Even if you're following God, you're promised bad things are going to happen. And you look, and Jesus had told them, for example, in chapter 13, he said, one of you are going to betray me, and pointed out that he himself, in chapter 14, he says, I'm going to be taken away from you. In chapter 15, he said that there be uh, there are people, in verse 18, the world hates you. You know it hated me before it hated you. That's an assurance, but still not very good to know that they hate me, they hated Jesus. That in itself brings sorrow. Then in chapter 16, he warns again, you know, you're, you're going to be offended, you're going to be thrown out of the synagogues. I mean, you look at all of that, and it's, you know, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, to encourage others to do that same thing. And then he's telling them, your life is going to be filled with all sorts of sorrows and discouragements. And you'd think, you know, what is he doing? But what he did, if you go to the 16th chapter, beginning in verse 19 and down through verse 22, he says, Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him. He said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? Verily I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into this world. And ye now, therefore, have sorrow. Now, that's where I want to key in on. We live in a world that is filled with sorrow. I have sorrow, you have sorrow. And I think I'm just like you. Sometimes it just, it seems like it just encompasses you. And you think, how can we go on? Is life going to be like this? And Jesus says, yeah, it is. You're going to have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice your joy, and no man taketh from you. I mean, what he's saying is, you know, you have a wondrous hope. And we need to understand that hope. Because every single one of us faces, in essence, the same things. The world wants to take away every good thing we have. The world wants to come down. There are so many things that happen to us that we just feel inundated. But we need to always realize that Jesus says, you have this sorrow, but you're going to have a fulfillment. You're going to have a joy, and no man can take that from you. In other words, if we hold on to it, it's, it's kind of reminiscent of what Paul says in Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And the only thing left out is, of course, ourself. But we have that joy that is there. If we want it, it's ours. If we want to be sustained through the sorrows, the trials of this world, it's ours. So we make the decision. Well, how are we going to have that? If we're going to have this heart that shall rejoice, I just got a couple of things on your notes there that we need to do. The first thing is we need to remember who it is that said this, who it is we're supposed to follow. You see, that's, the world wants us to move away from that. Forget about that. Don't follow that. It's not working. Well, sometimes people think because of the sorrows in the world, the, the struggles, the trials that come upon us, that Christianity isn't working. But God never said Christianity is going to take those away. But what he did say is, you need to look at me. You need to focus upon me. Last week, uh, Connor had a, a lesson out at Chipman Road in the youth rally, and he spoke about Peter and how Peter sank down in the water, and he made the analogy how that's us. You know, we sing that song, I was sinking deep in sin, 
But Jesus looked down and he put out his hand to Peter and Peter took it. You see, Peter wanted that. But Peter took it and Jesus lifted him up. And one of the points he made is we can never get so low that Jesus isn't there if we reach. We've got to look, we've got to focus on the one who it is. In John the 20th chapter, in verse 30 and 31, you know, many other things did Jesus in, his pre in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In other words, who said this? Jesus Christ. He is the one who said, You have sorrow, but your heart shall rejoice. He is the one who is omniscient, who knows all things. He is the one, in John the 16th chapter and verse 4, These things I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. In other words, I want you to remember these things I've told you about them. They're going to come about. How does he know that? Because he is the Christ, the Son of God. He is the one who knows all things. He knows the heart of all mankind. He understands what is within us. He understands all of the things surrounding us. In the 30th verse of that, he says, We're sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. We believe, we believe you came forth from God. You see, Jesus knows he knows about my struggles. He knows about my trials. He knew what the disciples then would face. He knows what we're going to face. The Hebrew writer talks about, you know, he can be touched with a feeling of our infirmity. We go boldly to the throne of grace because we know of his knowledge. He is the Son of God, the great I Am. In verse 9 through 10 of this chapter, he says that he talks about sin because you believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. He is the one who is with God. He is the one who will always be there. In verse 27, For the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I come forth from the Father and I'm coming to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And so we're talking about the Son of God, that great I Am. John 1, he talks about as the book begins. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst men. But we need to need, never lose sight of who He is. He is the one who will in this chapter also be united with the Father. He goes back to Him. And so these promises, you know, I can stand here and I can promise you all sorts of things. But if it's relying upon me, I can fail. I can overload my abilities. You know, I can say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be there for you. And then something may happen to me that I fail. And that's always heartbreaking when it happens. But Jesus never fails. He says he's going to be there. The Hebrew writer records, he says, I, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He himself said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I mean, this, this promise, this blessing is spoken by Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And so I stand on the promises. We sing that song. And the sorrows, the discouragements, the trials, they want to push us away. We need to do more than sing the song. We need to live the life. You know, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He is there. He promises. His word is sure. God cannot lie. All of these things. Remember who has spoken it and who you're to follow. Don't give in. But then remember that he is the one who has spoken. He is the overcomer. You go on down in John 16, in verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I mean, he spoke this before his death. Here's how certain Jesus Christ came to this earth. 
He knew what was going to be before him, but he knew, he knew with certainty that he could do those things. Though he took upon himself the form of man, he was tempted like you and I. He was tried like you and I. He said, I have overcome. It's that certain. And we have that certainty too. We're not following a maybe. We are following the Son of God. We're not following one who might win or might not. We are following the one who has overcome the world. In Revelation 17 and verse 14, They shall make war with the Lamb, and he shall overcome. And they that are with him, called and chosen and faithful. You know what that means? You and I. We recognize who he is. We recognize who promised. We recognize the struggle that is there. But we stay with him because he is victorious. The whole of the book of Revelation. You look at it and people look and they, they're in a quandary. What's it about? What's it about? Well, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revealing of him. It's the revealing of failures. It's the revealing of successes. It's the revealing of the battle. But to the heart of it whether you ever understand anything else about the book of Revelation, you look to the heart of it and you understand Jesus wins. That's the message. You know, you be faithful, I be faithful unto death, I'll receive a crown of life. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth, they shall rest from their labors. Jesus has made war against, but he shall overcome. And if I am with him, I too am an overcomer. You look and you think about that. You think about, you know, sometimes people think, you know, God's left me. Whenever the disciples were told about weeping, lamenting, do you think they prayed about that? I'm sure they did. I mean, one of the, one of the central teachings of Jesus is that you go to the Father. He himself demonstrated it. But you look and you realize that they might have prayed, oh, don't let this happen. Peter even stood with Jesus and said, you know, no. Whenever he said, you know, that these things befall him, and, and Peter said, no, it's not going to happen. And Jesus, of course, told him, you know, get behind me, Satan. But the realization is sometimes we go to God and we expect an answer that he said isn't going to happen. You know, we oftentimes pray, well, Lord, I, I pray, you know, that this doesn't happen to me at all. And, and we pray that, and sometimes things don't happen. But Jesus never promised that he was going to take away. You know, God never said, I'm going to take away the trials. And instead, he said, you're going to have struggles and trials. But the reality is, he answers the prayer. I have no doubt his disciples prayed you know, we pray he won't be taken from us. But he was. But you know what the answer was instead? He was the overcomer. And you'll have the strength to be with him. You'll have the strength to stay. You too can be an overcomer. You see, prayer and, uh, you know, prayer is, is not always what we want it to be. We may want a different answer, but... God gives us what we need and what's consistent with his will. And so his disciples, they believed, ultimately, Jesus is overcomer. The devil didn't win whenever Jesus was taken to the cross. That resurrection Jesus had told them, and they didn't understand all of it. You know, Matthew 24, he said, you know, tear down this. And they thought he was talking about the temple itself, but he was talking about himself. And he said, it'll be raised in three days. Can you imagine whenever they were told, come and see, he's risen. Can you imagine how they felt? Why didn't we understand that? Why didn't we understand what he said? Well, we have a fuller understanding. We know he was raised. And so we go to God and we ask him to be an overcomer and we can do it. We understand that he is the overcomer, and it's my choice whether I'm going to be with him. You know, we oftentimes don't get what we pray for and what we want. And sometimes people, they leave God because it isn't 
what they wanted it to be. I've heard people say, if God won't give me this one thing, there's no way that God is if he doesn't do what I say, and so I don't want anything to do with religion. I mean, that's saying, you know, I, I don't care. You know, God has revealed himself in his word. We know that he is through the creation itself, but I don't know about him. The only way I know about him, his reaction to me, his love towards me, the sacrifice, the hope of heaven, is through the word. But then I get on my high horse and I say, well, God, if you let this happen, I'm not going to follow you. You can't be real. Who am I? I'm now putting myself above all that can be examined, tried, proven. All that does is show the distortion of God and the creator and what I think my relationship is to him. Instead, I stand in awe as Jesus himself did. You know, he, whenever he died, he looked and he said, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's where our life is. I realize who it is that spoke. I realize that he is the overcomer. And so I look to God. And I, you know, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, one of my favorite verses. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I suffer all these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed. Why? I know whom I believe. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Does that mean that, that Paul got everything that he wanted the way he desired it? No. But he knew that even though he ended up in prison, he was stoned, he was in a shipwreck, he had people after him pursuing him, trying to destroy him and every good thing he had done. He said, I'm not giving up on God because God has not given up on me. In 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, David is an example of that attitude. Whenever he faced everything that would destroy so many people, the loss of a child, he looked to God and he says, you know, I know God's provided a way. I can go to be with him. He was able to cope with that sorrow. In Romans, the 10th chapter, the 9th and 10th chapter, the Apostle Paul looks at the destruction of a nation. The Jewish people, they rejected God. God had the right to demand certain things. They didn't want it. And as a result, God rejected them. Paul didn't give up. No doubt, I mean, you know, he said, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You can see the heartbreak in there. Paul is called the weeping prophet of the New Testament because he looked and he wept. But in all of that, he knew that he had to stay with God. He wasn't going to have any benefit for anybody. But in all those things, he still had comfort. He went on, and he would tell people, even whenever he was in prison, he was seeing all these things done. He said, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Can you imagine that? But that's how the heart that is filled with sorrow, you think upon the rejoicing that God gives, and you know that it's going to be okay. I can do it. I can keep on day in, day out. I can face the scourge. I can face everything the devil wants to throw at me. And I am going to keep on. Why? Because I know who spoke. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the omniscient one. He said, you have sorrow, but you can have a joy that no man can take from you. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul, he talked about really the basis of this hope. There are false teachers trying to, to look and say, there isn't any such thing as a resurrection. And sadly, there are people today that teach that same thing, even religious folk who look and they say, this is it. You know, just live the good life the best you can. This is all you get. Paul said, if that's the case, we are of all men most miserable. 
But if you look at that chapter, you'll find he makes a ninefold argument as to why the resurrection is real. And so we remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Is it hard? Yeah. Is it filled with discouragement? Yeah. Is there sorrow going to come upon you? You better believe it. But you know what? Though we have that in this world, we have the assurance that I can have a joy that no man taketh from me. You go on. John 16, he says those things, and then remember what we read a moment ago in verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. I mean, that, that's the key, isn't it? In the midst of the trial, in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the discouragement, and in the midst of all the disheartening things that Jesus told him, he said, in me you can have peace. Now, you want to look and historically go back and look at the first century? It was a quandary the world was in. The world threw everything they could at the first century Christians. And yet these people still rejoiced. How in the world do you explain that? Well, these things have I spoken unto you. That in me, they knew that in Christ, all things are provided. Not the ease that the world wants, but the ability to overcome. The ability to have a hope. He says, in the world you ever shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So he ends it by saying, you know, here I am. Life's hard. Devil's after you. Things are going to get you down. Come to me. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Our choice is to give in under the burden, the struggle, the trials, the sorrow, the pain of the world. Or it's to meet it face to face in Christ. And whenever we do that, we throw a kink into the world's thinking because they can't understand us. We don't stop. We don't give up. We keep going because, yeah, we have sorrow, but we know our hearts will rejoice. Remember what he said, in me. One of the great blessings is that you and I today, we look at this, and we, we have so much more than the disciples in the first century had. But we know that outside of Jesus, there's nothing. Because Ephesians 1 and verse 3, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. Now, it doesn't take a great philosophical mind to realize that if I want the blessings, the rejoicing of heart, I better be in Christ and I better stay there. So I take the steps. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know there's no other way. There are two other passages that talk about being in Christ by that means. But that's the only way the Bible ever speaks of about entering into Christ is being baptized. Tonight, you and I, as I said, we're going to face the sorrows, the turmoil, the discouragements, the pain of this world. There's no getting around that. It's part of life. But if we're in Christ, if we've made that decision, then I don't face him alone because he's never going to leave me nor forsake me. So I make the decision to be in him, and then I make the decision if I'm going to stay with him. I walk with him day in and day out. You know, the, the Bible over and over says he's never going to leave us, but what are we going to do with him? We oftentimes sing that song, you know, what will you do with Jesus? 
Well, that's not only initially, will I render obedience and follow the way that he says that I can have the blessing? But then will I continue to walk in the light as God's in the light? It's my choice. I know what we're going to face. And I pray that every one of us will face it with God. If so, then I can tell you, just as Jesus said, and that's the only reason I can say it, you're going to have sorrow in this world. But your heart's going to rejoice. What's your decision? I choose God. I pray that you will too as we stand and sing the song of invitation.